Human beings often talk about treasure. Treasure is something that is of value to a person, something that could be a real estate, for example, could be a car, could be some precious uh, 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 stones that people keep, and usually they go to some extraordinary length to preserve and keep such things. One thing that is inherent about earthly treasure, and which many people seem not to think about, is that earthly treasure has the capacity to capture the heart of its owner, so that the owner is always thinking, or the owner's mind is always focused on that treasure, whether that owner is there with the treasure or far away. And so, treasure is something that is of value. And that is how powerful that valuable thing can be in the sense that even while that person is away from that treasure, his mind may not be at rest. He may always be wondering and thinking, will somebody damage this treasure? Will somebody steal it? Or will it even, you know, uh, get corrupted and so similarly man himself is a treasure now i'm talking from the perspective of god you see there are more enduring treasures when it comes to god and so this is not again an attempt to lift up man beyond what he is but it is to state the truth of the word of God. The fact of scripture is that from the point of view of God, man himself is a treasure. This should be a cause to be humble before God. Yes, it should bring that humility before God. You know, it is important for us to reflect how could such a God that is so mighty, so majestic, think of human beings as a treasure? Well, you might be thinking of it that way. True, God is infinite. He's so many present. He's so many signs. <clears throat> and he's so many present. God is in way, way higher than human beings. And in reality, he is also completely independent of all his creation. And so you might be wondering then, how can such a mighty God have need for man? Well, not naturally, human beings have uh, gone to two extremes when it comes to thinking of the worth of a person before God. Some claiming to be humble, not wanting to elevate themselves higher than they really are, they claim that they are worthless before God. They claim there is nothing worthy of God's attention in their own lives. Such attitude and thinking may sound like humility, but in reality, it is another subtle way of insulting God. Bear with me, you will understand as we go along. <clears throat> Why considering man as worthless could be a way of insulting God. At the other extreme are those who are so haunting in their hearts. Their heart is full of their self-importance. They are full of pride. And they claim that they are so important, they are so powerful, that God can do nothing without their permission. God can do nothing without telling them. In fact, some I've heard somebody say that before God can do anything on earth, he has to be consulted first. So you imagine that level of pride that a man has. So, what we're seeing from those two extremes is that one, from confusion and error, 
you know, as to what is true humility before God, says he's worthless before God. The other, out of the pride of his hearty heart, makes him elevate himself so high that he says, without him, God can do nothing. But the reality and the truth is that humility, true humility before God, is the acknowledgement of the infiniteness and majesty of God with the corresponding worship that comes from a grateful and obedient heart. In other words, the person recognizes and acknowledges that God is infinite, God is majestic. And that knowledge then elicits genuine worship of God from a grateful heart for who God is and what God has done. That is true humility before God. The truth is, the child of God recognizing the enormity of what God has done for him, knowing he can never repay, bows down, from a heart filled with gratitude in humble adoration of such a loving, merciful God who is mighty to save. That brings me to the question, who do you think you are? Mind you, I'm not trying to insult you. I'm not trying to belittle you. But I want you to, for a moment, to reflect on that question. If somebody is to ask you, and you know this is a genuine person, and says, who do you think you are? What will be your answer? Yes, what will be your answer? Will your answer be from your own perspective, or the perspective of those you have spoken to, perhaps those who have praised you, or those who have put you down, or will it be from the perspective of God? Do you, then a great what God says he made with purpose and wonderfully too. In other words, do you put down, do you try to rubbish what God says is of value to him? What God says he deliberately created. That is again a very, very important question for you to reflect upon. So, and then, following that, I want to ask you again, will you spend your all to obtain something you consider worthless? Perhaps you by now know I'm leading up to something. Yes, what, who do you think you are? What do you think you are worth? Do you put down things that God values? And you, as a human being, who has treasure, remember, we're talking about treasure, will you spend your all to obtain something you consider worthless? I'm sure you will not. May God give us understanding in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Following that, I will ask you another question. Do you know or realize that you are precious to God? I believe and I hope I'm talking to somebody who is a believer. Not only in God, but he is a saved person who has been saved through the precious sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Who has had personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know or realize that you are precious to God? So that brings us to the topic we're going to be talking about in this video. And if you do not already know, this is to let you know that you are precious to God. That in reality, you are a twice treasure of God. That's the topic of what we're discussing in this video. So this is very, very important to get the right perspective, not to put ourselves too low as to insult God, and not to put ourselves too high 
again as to sin and consider ourselves to be above God. May the Lord God Almighty give us understanding in the name of Jesus. As usual, we will be looking at the Word of God. And so, we have some scriptures to look at. They are the anchor scriptures. We shall look briefly at Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27, and then 2 Corinthians 4, 7. And of course, we have to, it's always a good thing to read the word of God. And so, Genesis 1, 26 to 27, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. That's Genesis 1, 26-27. And 2 Corinthians 4, 7 tells us, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. May God give us understanding in Jesus' name. The advent of man, that is, man coming to the scene of God's creation. God reveals unto us in the Holy Scripture that he spoke his creation into existence. God said, but there is one element of his creation whose existence seemed to have involved more than the spoken word. That is the creation of man. Scripture informs us that God took the initiative that creating man was a deliberate action by God. In other words, man was not a product of mass production like God's other creation. You know, God said, let there be light, and there was light everywhere. Let the water appear. Let the earth appear. Let the earth bring forth. And trees, animals were produced in mass like that. that. That was not how God created man. Yes, that's true. From Genesis 1, 3 to 25, you have this phrase, let there be, let the waters, let the earth. Each time God spoke, millions, if not billions of species came into existence. Yes, that was the case concerning plants and animal life. Yes, even inanimate things like mountains, the stars, that's how they came to be. But man is not a product of evolution that evolved from some low-level creature. That came from, that theory came from the imagination of man. Became part of the pride of man. Human beings who refused and could not even imagine the mighty God who could do miraculous things. And so, concerning man, we do hear that there was a discussion. When you look at Genesis 1 26, we're told God said, Let us make man in our image. You know, remember there our anchor scripture? God was speaking. So when God spoke, apparently he was speaking to his counsel. And we are told further in scripture that man was made wonderfully and with capacity to relate to God. Psalm 139, 14. Yes, God wanted man to relate to him on that personal level. Indeed, we are told in scripture 
that God fellowship with man in the days of his innocence. Genesis 3, 8, 9. Yes, we're told the Lord God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. And the Lord God called, where are thou? You know, it's like you have an appointment with a friend you normally meet maybe at the park. And one day you got there and to your surprise that friend seemed not to be there and you called out. That was what God did. Again, the fellowship with man as God intended was soon interrupted. Yes, by the devil. Yeah, we are told in Genesis 3, the story of the fall of man. Mankind was thus separated from God by his sin. A man has continued in sin and rebellion against God since then. May he continue to uphold us in the name of Jesus. After the fall, God could have destroyed the first human couple and then he would have created either another set of human beings or a completely different species of creation. Obviously, God had the capacity to do this. For we are told in Exodus 32.10, when the Israelites sinned, God said, Moses should step aside, let him wipe them out, and then out of Moses, God was going to make a nation bigger than them. Yes, God had the capacity to do that. In the case of man, he did not. He chose to save mankind. The question you and I should be asking ourselves, why did God choose to save man? Why did God not just wipe out the couple and then replace them? Yes, again the question comes, what do you think you are worth in gold or any other precious metal that you know? Yes, I'm speaking from the, I want you to speak from the perspective of God. Do you think you are worth anything to God? You see, the means by which you were redeemed will give you a good idea of your worth in the sight of God. Think for a moment, if you have some precious thing or treasure you kept somewhere and you suddenly think that treasure is in danger what length will you go to redeem your precious treasure to le what level will you go to protect or to reclaim that place uh, that treasure the effort you will make will be a measure of how much value you place on that treasure. Do you know what? God went all the way to redeem his precious treasure. I said treasure, yeah. Remember that God had created man in his own image. Of all his creation, God is the only one we are told I mean, man is the only one we are told. God created in his image. So God loved man. Put another way, man is God's treasured possession. Yes, man is God's treasured possession. As a matter of speaking, remember, God gave the earth to man. Psalm 115, 16. Yes, God said, The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. For the earth had he given to the children of men. Have you ever thought of it? To support or to buttress this. Have you ever looked at Genesis chapter 1? You will notice that God first created all that man will require for his existence. That is Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 25. 
when all that man would need for his existence was made, then God chose to create man. Again, this is very important for us. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was speaking, spoke the truth that seemed to be a universal experience of human beings. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's the truth. For example, parents worry about their children when they are away. You know, you have, we worry about your house. You worry about your car. You, when we are now with those precious things that, you know, things that are precious to you. That is what Christ said. In Matthew 6, 21. And I venture to say, the Lord might have been speaking from experience. He knew how much the Father's heart was on earth. And how much he himself could hardly wait to come down to earth to overcome the strong man, the devil, and retrieve man, the treasure of God, that the devil had stolen with the intention to kill and destroy. Then remember that popular passage, John 10, 10. The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So the Lord came to earth because of the Father's treasure. That treasure is in his man. Are you still in the doubt? Do you still doubt? Why do you think the Lord of glory divested himself of his glory to come to planet earth and did not go to Jupiter, Mars, or any of those other planets named by man. Well, I say it can only mean one thing. Because of his treasure, which is man, is on earth. You may get it. Remember the statement again? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be. God's heart was on earth. Because his treasure, man, was on earth. And man had been corrupted by Satan through sin. Remember, man was made in God's image. And so we are told, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, he said, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Remember the question I asked before? To what length will you go to retrieve your, pre your, pre your treasure that had been taken by somebody else? And that the effort you put to retrieve that treasure, the effort you put to protect that treasure, will be commensurate to the value of that treasure to you. And God went all the way. Man was the lost treasure of God, stolen by the devil, if you like, that Christ came to save. May the Lord give us understanding in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> Only one person could redeem mankind. Yes. God's treasure was lost. God needed to do something about his lost treasure on earth. Yes, the treasure that has been corrupted and taken over by the devil through sin. God needed to redeem his treasure. By what means will man be redeemed that will meet the standard demanded by the law of justice and integrity of God. Yes. And so, remember, again, Jesus was there at the beginning. Yes, in Genesis 1, we were told, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. 
when you go to John 1 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, the Word was God. And so, Jesus knew man is God's peculiar treasure. For he was the one who created, he was there at the beginning. So he knew man is God's peculiar treasure. He loved man and loved his father even more. He knew his father's heart was on earth with his treasure. Again, remember the passage, Matthew 6, 21. That's why I said, perhaps the Lord was speaking from experience. When he uttered those words, that where your heart is there, where your heart be. Hadn't been with his father, knowing perhaps how God was longing for man that was in his lost and sinful state. So, and how he himself was longing to please God, his father, and longing also to redeem man that he loved. The father desired to reclaim. He desired the reconciliation of and the reestablishment of the broken relationship with man. Hence God took the initiative. He set the price of reconciliation, the price of redemption. His loving son volunteered to pay the set price. Isn't that wonderful? Do you think if you are worthless, God would have gone into the extraordinary length he went to redeem you. And that's why, remember the other time I said, we need to be careful so that in your trying to say you are humble, you don't claim to be worthless and thereby insult God. Because when you say you are worthless and then you now think of all the effort, all the resources, that God has put in place to redeem you. You might then be saying, God was saving what was worthless to him. If you were not worth of, if you are not of value, I put it to you that God would not have made the effort to save you. But the fact he has made the effort shows that God loves you and you have worth to him. Remember, the devil did not know the plan of God. Yes, we are told the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known, they would have crucified, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 to 8. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ knew all about the existing problem of the devil. Again, that passage in John 10, 10. Yes, the Lord was alluding to the devil. He is the one who is a thief, who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But the Lord is the one who has come to save life. As he say, I am come that they might have life. And that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. John 10, 10 to 11. The Lord came in the flesh. He came in the person of man through a virgin birth he grew up in obscurity though he was of the royal lineage of david for at the time of his birth the glory had departed and there was only a stump remaining in the stem of jesus yes the devil had among human beings very powerful allies. Yes, when Jesus came, the enemy wasted no time in seeking and obtaining the support of the culture, 
religious and later governmental leaders and the system to ensure victory for himself. Yes, the devil used the leadership. At the time, he thought he was winning. As we've just read in that passage there, he did not know he was only carrying out what God had already planned. If he had known, he would not have instigated and executed the crucifixion of the Lord of Glory. Again, telling us how powerful our God is. May God give us understanding in Jesus' name. Again, man was redeemed with God's best. His only begotten son. Matthew 20, 28. It says, even as the son of man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom. Do you think if you were worthless, God would have sent his son to die in your place? So please, stop saying you are worthless. There should be other ways and means for you to express your humility before God. But never tell God you are worthless. Because when you say that, you are saying God spends so much effort wastefully by claiming what is not what what's it by claiming some worthless thing meanwhile the while as far as god is concerned you are a precious treasure to god uh, the lord further said this is my blood of the new testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins matthew 26 28 how was God's, the Lord speaking? He laid down his life for you because you were precious to him and to his father. I hope that sinks in. And rather than making you to be proud, it should bring you in humble adoration to the place of worship of God from a heart that is grateful for who God is and for what he has done for you. That is true humility before God. In other words, you worship God because you are grateful. You obey God because you are grateful. You are not worshiping God because you are afraid of going to hell. You are not worshiping God because you are, you are afraid of what the devil will do to you. In other words, again, put another way. You are worshipping and you are being God out of love. May God give us understanding in the name of Jesus. Since the victory of the Lord on the cross, yes, Christ was very, very much victorious. Though the devil executed all his repertoire of wills, the vices are no less he was capable of but the lord came out victorious and in power matthew 28 18 to 20. you are told jesus said all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth yes since then the devil is a fallen enemy and is under restraint the devil is under restraint now by God. Remember the desire of the devil? Left on his own, the devil wants to supplant God and failing that to destroy man as a way of hurting God if that were possible. But it's under constraints placed by God. Yes. Hence, the devil cannot do all the evil he is capable of doing, nor all the evil he wants to do. I put some scriptures there for you to reflect upon. Scriptures that tell us that there is a boundary set by God 
beyond which the devil cannot go. Remember one thing today. Where God commands, even the devil obeys. May God give us understanding in the name of Jesus. Please do remember, you belong to God. Again, I put some scriptures there for you to reflect upon. As we're told, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which live it and abide it forever. First Peter 1 Peter 1.23 Remember, Christ is the propitiation for the sins of all believers, including you. In other words, God, Jesus Christ, is the appropriate sacrifice for all your sins. 1 John 2 2. Again, we are told Christ purchased all believers, including you, with his own blood. Acts 20 28. We are told. So it is very important for us to recognize this. Hence, if you have been saved, you do not belong to yourself. No. You belong. To Christ. As we are told in 1 Corinthians 6 19 20. Hence, you, the saved sinner, now a believer in and a disciple of Christ, you are the first treasure of God. The second treasure is the gospel of Christ. Yes. Remember again, there were men later described by Annas the high priest and his kindred to be unlearned and ignorant. That's Acts 4 6 and 13. They proved they were the right choices for the ultimate teacher and builder, our Lord Jesus Christ. Because when he came, he picked commoners. He taught them. And they became the foundation of the church. Yes, through the apostles and their foundational pioneering work. Again, Ephesians 3.20, the Holy Spirit walking through them. The biblical Christian faith was birthed on the day of Pentecost. Acts 1, 1, Acts 2, 1 to 4. And so the word continues to witness the presence and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we are told, Romans 1, 6, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first, and also to the Greek. Romans 1, 16. The gospel of Jesus Christ is power, and it is precious. May God give us understanding in the name of Jesus. Remember, the vessel is the first treasure. That vessel, we are told, is you the believer? Yes, Second Corinthians four seven tells us. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, and not of us. I often hear people say uh, they have saved somebody because they preach the gospel. Brother, sister, know this. You are never capable of saving yourself, not to even talk of saving anybody else. You are just a vessel that God uses as it pleases him. The believer in Christ himself, a treasure of God, carries the gospel of Christ, another treasure of God. We need to understand that and we need to believe. 
The believer in Christ is a treasure of God. He carries the second treasure, the gospel of Christ. God is same chooses and prepares his vessels. The first step is usually the salvation of the will be vessel. The vessel accepts the gospel and confesses Christ as Savior and Lord. The usable vessel must be clean, empty, and available for service. And so we are told the believer in Christ must seek to become a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.21 And so believers in Christ are vessels that God uses. We are earthen vessels so that we will depend on the power of God and not on our own in the propagation of the gospel. Remember, the jars of clay are inexpensive, brittle, and easily broken. Again, this illustrates the truth that the power released through the preaching of the gospel is from God and not from the believers who are the earthen vessels preaching the gospel. And so it is a question of treasure within treasure. Within the earthen vessels, within the earthen vessel that is the believer in Christ, is the gospel, another treasure of God. And the believer in Christ is a treasure carrying another treasure, the gospel of Christ. Do not be bored with my repetition. I'm just trying to make sure you understand. As long as the vessel guides the treasure, God also guides the vessel. Believers in Christ must focus on the treasure and not the vessel and on the master and not on the servant. One way for believers in Christ not to give up in the face of serious challenges is by remembering that they are privileged to have the treasure of the gospel in themselves, who are those vessels of clay are precious to God too. Remember, the enemy fights both the gospel, the visible treasure, and the vessel, the visible human treasure that carries it. Second Corinthians four four. Yes. We are told the devil fights against the gospel and believers in Christ. Through planting and sustaining false religion, philosophy, false pro- teachers and prophets. Yes, Second Corinthians 4, 4 tells us, The God of this war had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The battle has continued till this day, as the gospel continues to be unveiled. Yes, through the preaching. Yes, the battle has continued to this day as the gospel continues to be felt from the perishing even to today. Again, first treasure, the believer in Christ. Second treasure, the gospel of Christ. Second Corinthians 4, 6. May God give us understanding again. Remember, The second treasure is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God and the face of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Uh, Hopefully by now, although I still say it, you realize the believer is precious to God. God sent his only begotten son, yes, to save sinful humanity 
I want you to again reflect on these scriptures I've put there. Luke 19, 10. John 6, 36, 37 to 40. And verse 44. This was because you are valuable to God. Though you may not have adequate knowledge as to your value to God, it is clear that He loves you and decided to save you. Nothing can be plainer than what Christ said. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Do you think when you were lost, if you were worthless, God would have come looking for you? The fact that God came looking for you through his son shows you are precious to God. And how did God get to you through the gospel? That is the second treasure. Uh, treasure. And Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 44. And Jesus gives the assurance that whoever comes, he will not cast away. I will read it again. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which has sent me, that all which he had given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son, and believe it on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 37 to 40. So my question is, are you a genuine believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is the Lord Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord? If you answer yes, then you are doubly precious to the living God. You are God's treasure, and you carry another treasure of God, the gospel of Christ in you. Again, it's very important for us to recognize this, that you are a treasure. We're told there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. Luke 15, 7. Do you think heaven will rejoice over a worthless thing? God forbid. Again, remember, you were once a sinner, which means there was joy in heaven when you repented and were saved. Each person saved is another manifestation of the victory of Christ on the cross over the devil and his kingdom of darkness. A resounding defeat for the devil and his courts. And further, if the death of his saint matters to God, as truly it is, we are told, precious is this in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalm 116, 15. Then his saints are important to him. Brother, sister, you are precious to God. This knowledge will humble you, the true believer in Christ. Especially when you realize that you have not done anything special or important to warrant such love from God. You are doubly precious to God. I can't say that enough. Remember, because you are precious, God has refused to give up on you. He refused to give up, give up on mankind. God refused to replace man 
with another kind of species. It's true, many derogatory things are said about man and the devil, about man and the devil, many of which are true. God himself says many unsavory things about man, and God will never lie. For example, God tells us that the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yes, the word of God says the every inclination of man is to sin and wickedness. Yes, yet all these unpalatable attributes have never been able to discourage man, God from doing everything possible to save man. And we are informed that God, God's determination to save was not an afterthought, but a deliberate act. Yes, God planned to save. God's plan to save was a deliberate act. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. That's speaking of believers in Christ. Ephesians 1, 4 to 5. So when a person believes in Christ and is saved, the sinner becomes a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. As a new believer in Christ begins to be transformed by the Holy Spirit to the instrument of the word of God, he begins to be productive and fruitful. Remember this, the light of the gospel does not shine in your heart simply to give you knowledge of salvation. You are not the end of your blessing. Rather, you are blessed to be a blessing to others. Again, you are a twice treasure of God. Resolve now to every day be the blessing you are to be to others that come your way. May the Lord keep you in the name of Jesus. And I pray that as a child of God, the gospel light will begin and continue to shine through you to others. And you will daily be the twice treasure of God as the glory of God over your life is seen by others. In Jesus' name. But please remember that all that have been said concerns the child of God, the believer and the disciple, the believer in and the disciple of Christ. But if you are not yet a believer, if Jesus Christ is not yet your Savior and Lord, please, this does not apply to you. But God has not forgotten you, for you can become born again. You can become a child of God, a follower of Christ. Yes, as you have seen, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 But from the discussion in this video, you will see God still wants to save the sinner. Just so he knows the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 Yes, you cannot save yourself. That was why God made the provision. Because he still loves you. He wants to save you. Romans 5, 8, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him will be saved. And so, all you need is confess and believe. Romans 9, 9-10 Whoever shall call, that is God's challenge of everyone. Romans 10, 13 Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ is calling you now. Hear his call. 
come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight to thirty. What are you waiting for? Please heed the call of Christ today. Open your heart to the gospel of Jesus Christ. May the Lord accept you into His kingdom. As you appropriate the finished sacrifice of Christ, Jesus Christ on the cross, in Jesus' name, Amen.